unmute. All right. Uh, right. So it turns out. Maybe I can ask sure. Yeah. So was that actually is proportional charge? Right? right. So why are they not integers? No. So so you get an integer if you integrate over the unit cell. So then, so if you integrate over the unit cell, you should get two pi. Yeah. So this is one unit cell, and you get modulations because it's a crystal. Right. Okay, so now people have used this method of emergent modulated gauge, gauge fields in electronic transport, where they try to use strain to modulate these things in connections with fractional Chur and insulator physics. So this could give you some idea of if there could be some sort of bosonic analog to all of this. However, I will not go in this direction. What I want to talk about, again, is a scattering problem. How does an incoming magnon from a ferromagnet scatter off this configuration? And to do that, again, I want to be as analytical as possible so I do some sort of a reverse engineering approach. I start from a continuum energy functional, which realizes the configuration I showed you earlier from the theta functions as its minimum, right? So that's what the Q naught R is. Q naught R is exactly the topological charge density generated by these theta functions. So I take my theta function ansatz as the minimal energy configuration about which I can then expand and do linear spin wave theory. Right, so you have two terms. The first is the Coulomb exchange. The second is the topological charge density. Then you can do standard spin wave theory. When you expand and see the form of the variation of the energy functional, you see that I've written it in a suggestive way. That should the second one should be Ay. Sorry about that. That this resembles. If you take g equals zero, this resembles that of a charged particle scattering of a magnetic field, where the Ax and Ay actually depend on the texture of your skormion crystal. So this is where the emergent gauge field really comes from mathematically, right? Okay, so now that we have done that, you want to do some sort of numerics because that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Mm. So is it abelian? So here, uh, yeah. Coupling to what? Sorry. Right. No, so so I don't consider any strong or weak coupling here. So what I'm essentially doing, I start from the energy function on the top. I expand about my minimal ansatz and taking to second order, I just get this form of the energy functional. I have not made any assumption about G or J. This is just what the variation looks like. I think I can comment that because if you use an electron, since the electron starts spinning, otherwise you're in a million state, right? Right. Here, you can't spin it. Right. So it's, it's a it's, yeah, so it's it's just a charged particle scattering off a magnetic field, but whose variation is given now by the topological charge density. Right, okay, so once you have this, now you have to discretize this because at the end of the day, you want to obtain some sort of transmission or reflection matrices to get your transmission spectra. Turns out that's not a trivial problem in any way. You can easily discretize the J term, that's just standard finite differences, but the topological charge density term is much harder to discretize on any kind of real space grid. And there's a very cute story based on geodesics and spherical geometry, which expresses this discretization problem as a nearest neighbor tight binding model. But again, you can ask me this later if, you're, if you have time. Now, once you have discretized this on your real space grid, you have to do some sort of recursive transfer matrix approach. So you start off from the left end of your slab, and then you propagate your amplitudes product uh, uh, slice by slice to the right end. And then at the end, you do some rotation to get transmission and reflection. However, turns out that this approach suffers generically from numerical instabilities if you have any kind of evanescent wave contribution. Because if you have that, then the largest eigenvalue of your matrices will be greater than one. If you multiply a sequence of such matrices, the product matrix will, be, will blow up. So this method is essentially hopeless. So we were stuck on this um, for quite a while. Thankfully, an Englishman came to our rescue. Not often in history has an Indian said this, but this is true in this case. Uh, so John Pendry actually developed a method in optics quite a long time ago, which did this exactly in the lattice formulation. So we have adapted that for this configuration. And you can ask me later if you're interested in that. All right, so let me show you after doing all of this methodology, what do you actually get? 
So firstly, you can separate this very nicely into two different energy scales. You have a low energy sector and you have a high energy sector. The low energy sector has something very interesting, which we term the Riemann Goldstone Landau level. And I'll tell you why, and hence the pretentious title at the beginning of the talk as well. The reason why we call it the Riemann Goldstone Landau level is if you turn G equals zero in the energy functional that I showed you earlier, then the lowest energy band you have is pinned. It's a zero energy flat band because of holomorphic constraints if your G is equal zero, right? So your lowest energy band will be a zero energy flat band on top of which if you now turn G on, so it's G is not equal to zero, Goldstone modes will arise. So if Goldstone modes have no dispersion, then this is zero energy flat band because of holomorphic constraints. And then you get Goldstone modes if you turn on G. And because of this magnetic field picture, the higher levels you get are non-uniform Landau levels. Landau levels because of magnetic field, emergent magnetic field, non-uniform because the topological density is not just constant, it's a modulated topological density, right? And so you get the structure and turns out you can infer this sort of very nice structure exactly from the transmission spectra. So on the bottom right here, so in, in this plot here, I show you the transmission amplitude, the total transmission amplitude uh, as a function of the incoming magnon energy. And you can see this splits very well into two separate sets of peaks. These peaks are linearly spaced peaks. And this linear spacing between the peaks actually tells you that the Goldstone modes of the Skirmion crystal have linear dispersion, right? For a reason that'll become very clear when I provide heuristics next. And so you can see that you have two sets of peaks with different separation, indicating that you have two different velocities given by the blue curves over here. So these are your different Goldstone modes. So just focus on the blue curves for now. And when you go to the high energy sector, you see that the transmission occurs in bands, which are separated by a uniform gap. This tells you exactly what the gap between your effective Landau levels are in the high energy sector and what the width of those effective Landau levels are as well. So not only does this, these transmission signatures from the scattering problem provide you direct and unambiguous signatures of a quantum all skirmion crystal phase of matter, they allow you to tell in great detail the nature of its excitation spectrum and degree of crystalline order. Yeah, yeah sorry. In your, your, uh, mm, yeah. Right. Yeah. No, so we haven't thought about the S state problem yet. We were just considering a magnon scattering through the skormion crystal. There might be possibilities of some bound states between magnons and skormion crystals at the end. Yeah. Right. So I, do, I, I don't know to, to what extent this, um, because it's an emergent magnetic field, right? So it's, it's akin to say an electron passing through a area of strain, right? So in that sense, I don't know how much the ed state physics of the quantum Hall picture carries over to the case here where, because essentially, so you have two magnetic fields in the problem. You have the magnetic field that you apply for the quantum Hall uh, effect, right? And then you have this emergent magnetic field which comes from the topological charge density. Yeah, so I don't know how, how, how like if it's one to one in terms of edge state physics as well. Yeah. Okay. Could be. Yeah. But that's not something we haven't explored. Right. Okay. So now let's consider. Let's come to heuristics. I've given you this complicated description based on these uh, fancy methods. But is there a simple way to understand all of this? Turns out there is. So you have a ferromagnet in the low energy sector. You have a quadratically dispersing magnon. What's the simplest system you can think of that has a dispersion mismatch? Well, it's the antiferromagnet. So let's cook up a very simple model of a ferromagnet antiferromagnet junction. Let's even forget the fact that the antiferromagnet is bipartite and the boundary. And so let's create some sort of boundary matching that completely ignores that problem. This problem you can essentially solve by hand. You can write down some boundary matching problem and you see that the transmission spectra looks like this. So I have plotted here the transmission coefficient as a function of incidence angle of the magnon and the magnon incidence energy. And you can see that if you go along a cut of fixed theta, if you take a horizontal line like this, you can see after a certain energy, you will again get discrete peaks, which are linearly spaced, right? And this tells you this matches with the picture of the Scorpion crystal as well. And it tells you that these are essentially fabry perot like peaks because of your cavity structure. You have multiple reflections and transmissions. So you get fabry perot like peaks and the spacing between these peaks 
tells you the nature of the dispersion of whatever you have in the sandwich structure. And if they're linearly spaced, that means the gold stone modes in the middle are also linearly dispersing. Now let's come to the second heuristic picture for the high energy sector now. I told you, again, there's this emergent magnetic field going on. So let's consider the problem of a charged particle in a magnetic field, right? So let's start off from the very simple case of a constant magnetic field in the center. Now this you can analyze very simply using semi-classical cyclo cyclotron orbits. If the magnetic field is not strong enough, your charged particle enters, cyclotron radius isn't large enough, it just goes back, it's fully reflected. However, if now the magnetic field is very large, your cyclotron radius is large, and so the particle actually manages, manages to exit through the other side, but with a shift in velocity, right? This is similar to the qualitative picture on a magnon scattering of a single skirmion in some way. So you can construct a very simple sort of transmission reflection coefficient diagram based on this, and this follows through. You essentially have two regions of full reflection on the left and right, and above you have full transmission. The important thing to know is that you have an energy threshold E star based on your value for magnetic field below which you never have transmission. What? 10 minutes left. We'll All right. Perfect, thank you. All right, so now the important thing to note is the threshold because once you introduce modulations along Y, you, will, you can actually get transmission below this threshold as well. So let's do that now because remember the magnetic field will mimic the topological charge density and the topological charge density wasn't constant. It was highly modulating. So to get some sort of qualitative picture, we need to be accurate in that regard. So let's first look at the spectra. If you have constant magnetic field, you have flat Landau levels. Now, as soon as you introduce dispersion along Y, you see that these Landau levels become dispersive. If you further introduce dispersion also along the X direction, these dispersive Landau levels are pushed closer together. So now let's see the transmission spectra. So over here, you can see the transmission amplitude for various values of modulation along Y. If you had no modulation or negligible modulation as the light blue curve show, you essentially have no transmission because your critical energy threshold is too high, it's way above. However, if you have large modulations as you do in the skormion crystal for the topological charge density, you can get some resonance scattering processes of bound states. And that can give you transmission. Because remember, if you modulate along Y, then your transverse momenta is no longer conserved fully. It's only conserved modulo two pi over A. And so you can get off diagonal scattering processes, which can become resonant if the energy of your incident magnon coincides with that of the bound state. So if your energies coincide of these dispersive Landau levels as they do, you can get regions of non-zero transmission below your critical energy threshold set by set by the constant magnetic field case. And if you further vary your uh, magnetic field along X, you can see, as you can see in the red curves, these regions of non-zero transmission get pushed closer to each other, which matches with the description of the spectra being pushed closer towards each other. Right, so what I have essentially told you that this magnon scattering setup in the a uh, simple SU2 skormion crystal allows you to probe a combination of topology and symmetry breaking, which manifests in this Riemann Goldstone Landau level and these higher energy effective Landau levels. And you can essentially probe all of these features directly by just looking at the transmission spectra of your outgoing magnon on the other side. Now that's the bit I wanted to talk about for pure SU2 spin or uh, valley skormion crystals. Now, if we talk about spin valley entanglement, I will just go to the summary first and wait for any questions. I would encourage you to ask me about entanglement in the question, but before that, I just wanna pause and show you the summary. So the left side is what I've presented to you. If you ask me a question, I can tell you a bit about the right side as well. Thank you for your attention. You know, great job. Yeah. Questions are like this, obviously in the audience. Yeah. Does your method allow you to look at the melting of the uh, lattice? If you uh, want the melting, does it change the melting points? Yeah, so, so we are looking at purely isotropic skormion crystals. However, uh, again, I, I wanted to clarify that these are in no way optimal configurations given. So if you give me a Hamiltonian and tell me, is this sort of the optimal skormion crystal that you would get as the ground state? That won't be the answer. We're considered we're just constructing an ansatz for a skormion crystal. Right. And so presumably you can estimate 
Right. Function of the moment. Yeah. As a function of the coupling constant G in your, in your action. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. That, that could be, but we haven't thought about that problem in detail yet. But that's an interesting question. Yeah. I mean, if we, you could. So when you say melting, you mean like, is there some sort of positional change in these scormion cores? Or? At some point, the right. some point fluctuations will become so large yeah. that the order of balance is just like in the next right. two right. inch lenses on that. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose I would like to know how close you are to that. Right. Whether because the scormions are very big, there's almost no fluctuations, or what's the dimensionless parameter corresponding to one over S in an antiferromagnet? I see. Do you, do you have an idea of that? Mm. Uh, no, not at the moment. I can't do that, but I'll, that that'll be something to look into. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And how much would you need to cool down this system to see this to this images? How much would you need to cool down? Yeah. Oh, okay, an experimental question. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I guess if you if you get Whatever the temperature required to get a, a quantum Hall scormion crystal, that, that would be my answer. I, I, I yeah. So, so, so you can. I mean, if you if you get in graphene, actually, you can get the quantum Hall effect at pretty high temperatures, right? Uh, so that might be, that might come into play over here. So presumably, if you're tune, you're filling to mu equals one near a quantum Hall ferromagnet, you could also get a scormion crystal by just doping slightly away from it. So I, I hope the temperature shouldn't be too low, but I can't give you an exact number. Yeah. So maybe I have one. Yeah. Oh, so, so. Yeah. Maybe have an experimental one as well. So I'm in the uh, graphene systems. Yeah. So what are the relevant energy scales uh, for the for these crystals? And, um, what right. do you expect if you actually drive some current say say any back action on the scurmy and that's it, for example? I mean, how would it respond to external probes? Like that? Mm, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, so in, in terms of energy scales, right? So I guess that in some sense would depend on, on sort of the stiffness of, of the crystal, which would I guess come from these because the, the model we use here, there are essentially two scales, J and G. Right, so th those are the only scales in our model, and that comes from basically the the Coulomb interaction that you have in graphene. But the good thing in graphene is that this is tunable, so you could tune this using gates, which are anywhere there in your experimental apparatus, and then uh, so you could essentially tune uh, these J and G ratios, and I guess come to an optimal point where the stiffness of the crystal is is large enough so that there it is rigid in some sense to these kind of probes, and it doesn't really move around when you say it. So, right, so, yeah. so the first approximation is that the scamming crystal is kind of a solid background. Right, exactly. The, that's uh, the that's uh, the which, which uh, yeah, that's the regime in which we are working on yeah, currently. Okay, more questions? If not, then let's thank you all again. And, um, Thanks. Mm-hmm.